Lasco was meant to facilitate this panel discussion in the afternoon. Mela Davila, thank you very much to the facilitators, thanks to Menac and Picasso, because both Jorge and Mela have accompanied us in the journey of organizing this joint program, which it seems like it's been quite successful. I haven't prepared my introduction for Philippe Artier, but let me improvise. Someone is chasing Jorge out of the bathroom. <laughs> Philippe Artier, thank you for being here. Since the very beginning we thought of you to join us in the International Symposium, Jorge Blasco is joining us. As you know, he's an historian, Jorge. This is all about you. I mean, it was meant to be you up here. Thank you very much for having waited for me, first of all. I would like to say that it's been two days introducing admired friends, which is posing some self-esteem problems to me. I'm going to introduce Philippe Artier, a very well-known professional. I would like to do so by reading what he has sent us to introduce his presentation and I would like to share a few quotes that I rescued from his text. Three quotes actually. In his presentation he says old papers do not become archives until they have not gone through a long journey a series of gestures that tend to archiving. Archives are alive, we manipulate them, we transfer them and we exhibit them by composing albums, compilations or organizing short exhibitions during family gatherings. Archives, in order to be considered so, are manipulated and eroded. How can these vernaculous practices be transferred to heritage archives, be them in museums or archive center, se centers. I'd like to read a few sentences which are very important for those of you who are not acquainted with his work. The self was taken seriously. The researcher escaped the library to find edited documents which oftentimes ends up becoming a social dump site. Another interesting quote is one of the members of the family will become an amateur archivist. And this is a topic that interests me particularly. Thanks to the help of the genealogist, he will put all the documents in order by writing down the names of the individuals identified in a picture. Until the mid seventies, history, was written in third person of the plural, but in May 68, the self entered into the equation, end of quote. Well, I am not gonna dig into Philip's CV. I'm gonna hand it over to him right away. Philip, thank you very much and I hope you feel well introduced. I am going to go back to my seat. Thank you, darling. Now I have the feeling that everything has been said. First of all, my apologies for speaking in French. I will be the only one to speak in French, but First of all, I would like to warmly thank the Museum Picasso, the Manac, and all my dear friends and colleagues 
who have organized this amazing gathering. After more than 20 years reflecting about the topic, it's timely to organize an international symposium to reflect about archiving practices, art practices, a gathering with historians. And yeah, I've been invited because I'm an historian and as you have showed this morning, archives are not limited to historians anymore, are not limited to archivists anymore, they are social objects and for us, for historians, archives, I mean this is an important turning point and we have to embrace it. We cannot consider that there is a an archive on the one hand side and society at large on the other hand. We need to find a bridge and for me as an historian is a real challenge that poses many difficulties and in the next 20 minutes this is a topic that I will try and reflect upon from different in perspectives bearing in mind that archives today are in a material mutation process and well, we have been speaking about many different topics since yesterday morning and we are referring to different objects. One could think on whether Boltonsky, Christian Boltonsky, sorry, well, the idea of archive is at the heart of his work and um, probably artists and archivists speak about the same objects or not, I'm not sure about this not to speak about historians historians and archivists work in partnership in our times and we believe we also are part of the debate so I would like to share a few experiences with you and I will try to elaborate on a topic that has already been raised, the heart. And that's why I'm going to speak about the hands, manipulation, touching the archives, manipulating the archives, because archives are alive when it to use them and inhabit them. To start, I would like to share a history that I hold very dear, a non-European history or anecdote, even if it's related to our history, because it's us Europeans who invented slavery. So this history is about Henry Box Brown, who was an Afro-American slave. He was born in 1815, he had a slave life and in 1848, which is a very important date in France, that marks the abolishment of slavery, no, it's the case, no, not the case in the US, he became a brown slave, he moved into another category, he then moved to the west coast, east coast, sorry, and that's why he's called Henry Box. He did so in a postal box. He hid in a post box. Now regarding what you mentioned before, the box as archive is relevant. It's the only means he found. He bought a postal box and he was sent to the East Coast. Upon his arrival to Boston, he was picked up by two abolitionists, McQueen and Still. But the history didn't end there because these two abolitionists brought or encouraged Henry Box. And we know how important it is 
to have testimonies, well, they encourage him to write his autobiography, which was published later on with his timeline and the narrative about his personal journey. And this is not the last event explained in the autobiography. Henry decided to devote his life to developing a panorama. a show that was displayed from north to south of the east coast of the US and in the show he spoke about his life as a slave. He activated his memory and he activated uh, somehow an archive. So this is a very powerful gesture with no labeling or inscription archives according to Box Brown he's part of this archival tradition for him documents were less important than narratives and this is why we only have this tiny leaflet about his work. I believe this illustrates to what extent memory, the memory of minorities, get lost in the process and I will go back to these lost identities, to these lost memories which impose us the task and the responsibility of exhibiting archives for them not to get lost in the process. What Henry Brown did was to, well, at least from my perspective, he spoke up, but not only this, but also he incarnated in the bodily sense the archive. He was incarnated in a in an archive. I say this from a Foucault and Derrida perspective. So yeah. Of course he paid a high price. He ended up broke. He moved to Scotland and he ended up being broke. He had to stop sharing his life in shows and he became a he became the African chief. He became another character and he died completely alone. Beyond this being metaphoric, why am I interested in Brown's history and why am I so attached to it? Because, well, I believe it reminds us to what extent anonymous characters speaking up is, let's say, sustained by an order in narratives, an order that authorizes, and probably this is one of the boundaries, right? It's an authorized archive we are speaking about, a tolerated archive. This is not a, an archive against an institution. It's an accepted archive, which is inscribed in a certain form of rememoration. He wrote his memories in the framework of or in the context of abolitionism, and he had the right to do so. He considered himself the object of his own narrative, and I believe he 
was more than that. He was a promoter and at the same time he was not followed by others in his project. Why is this important? Well, Brown is a relevant figure, a relevant character, because it has to do with unveiling processes, with putting light on realities and the conditions in which this happens with gestures, with conditions and parameters. And of course, this has nothing to do with politics, well, perhaps a little bit with politics, of course, but for us, for researchers today in 2023, the question is about how to make knowledge visible, and I believe that this has been the topic of your presentation this morning. Allow me to divert a little bit here. Art has been influential on historians, especially in the context of encounters on art environment. Et l'art contemporain me semble euh... contemporary art. And this is the reverse perspective. It is very stimulating for us as historians, given its relationship not as much with archives but more with documents so i'd like to reminisce uh, do a bit of reminiscence of an italian artist swiss, swiss of italian origin massimo forland you might have seen this show previously this is a show created precisely by massimo forland in lausanne first in the vd theater with some invisible people for the theater, Italian immigrants that were literally occupying the cafe every afternoon in the theater. They never, they never drank or had anything and they were playing cards. They played cards, they spoke Italian, they played cards, they spoke Italian and nothing more. So the people in the theater, you know that in our cultural institutions. Sometimes we don't know what to do with these people. You cannot discriminate them, of course, but you feel slightly uncomfortable. So Massimo spoke Italian and he said, he went to see these people, asked them what they were doing, spoke to them, and then he proposed something to them. He was invited to the theater for the entire weekend, the Vidi Theater in Lausanne. So he proposed to them that they could become maybe a disturbers or um, disruptive characters in the plays. These anonymous retired people, what I forgot to say about them is that they are a very rich part of the Swiss society because they are the ones who build the Tebas temple. So he told them, you're going to dress up as Superman and these retired people, they accepted, they were going to dress up as Superman and you are going to talk about a historian who thinks about Massimo Forlan. And then he did something else with Claire de Boubier, and he said, I'm sure that each one of you has a story and archives, so let's try and all together write your story. At the end, they did a show called The Italians. There are some extra excerpts on the internet, so you can find them easily if you wish. This artistic show is for me very important because back then, in those times, we were doing a different type of work. In which, in a very lengthy manner, 
we spoke about lots of things and one day they came on stage dressed up like this and we were in the theater and they disrupted what we were doing. It's like having them here today, um, stopping our speech. Uh, why am I interested in this? Well, because for 20 years I have been in charge of Michel Foucault's archives and a notion of Foucault's I am very interested in is the notion of the murmurs of the world. In her archives you can see lots of things that are written that are not heard but um, they are related to the murmurs of the world. So people who are interned in psychiatric centers and um, these are things that we like to have in our universities and centers. So right next to the archives there's many more things as we were saying yesterday. There's many more archives that for sure in my opinion, are uh, more interesting, socially speaking, than the archives of the great philosopher and painter. So, I went in the search of those papers. I searched in paper bins, even, I'll tell you why. I was looking in the garbage, in the trash, and whatever was left of the papers and documents, because these were not yet archives, and they could end up being archives one day. I sometimes have the feeling that we talk about documents, but we don't talk about archives. In order to consider them as archives at some point, the documents need to transform or become archives. So, gradually, I tried to explore all this, I tried to preserve all this, and put it in a corner in my office in Paris. I kept pilot piling up boxes with anonymous correspondence and journals. And why? Well, because this event that took place in 2009, we've forgotten all about it. As we've also forgotten, and I wish we'd get as much, but we've forgotten how the archives of the state of Haiti have become a whole bunch of paper. I have a photo, but I can't show you all the photos that I have. So at a given point in time, the certainty that we have archives and the certainty that they're consolidated and they're never going to move is not true. We have not spoken about this today. But with digital archives, there is a very significant question that is set forth. The question is, are we not killing the future when we archive? Because you know that our databases have... Uh, crazy environmental impact so the past is literally eating up the future so how do we do this so that on the one hand the archive is collapsing and then on the other hand we have this archiving method which entails destruction we are in a certain way destroying the future and this is a political matter really that we need to think about And this leads me to the hypothesis of Sebald's, I'm sure you know. He talks about literature and how artists are forced to think in a different way in terms of our relationship with archives. With Sebald, there's this idea that there's nothing left and archives need to be reconstituted and the idea that catastrophe, that, that, that a disaster has taken place and the disaster obviously is what Ringelblum also shows. For me, Emmanuel Ringelblum is a major figure in archival science in the 20th century. It is a historian, he's a historian that within the Varsovia method seeing that Nazis are going to eliminate the ghetto he decides to create an archive, a collection of archives, 
of the life in the ghetto, but in Yiddish land, which literally will be wiped out of the map of Europe because the destruction, destruction of Jews in Europe is not only the destruction of bodies, but also the destruction of an entire culture and all the trace of it. So Ringelblum made this so such powerful move and action of creating this collection. And two of these containers were found. So I'm now going back on the fact that archives and the way we see them nowadays in our depots Well, this is the Bocas de Rona in Marseille a picture or a photo of the archive. These are documents that people carried with them, on them. And when I was displaying these documents in order to take the photo, they're almost like stones from tombs because this is the only thing that is left. And within, you can see some personal words. It is the only remaining archive, but it is intimately linked with the body. It's binded to the body because these are some notebooks that workers carried on them when they moved from one city to the next to work. It was like a sort of passport. We know that passports first were work pass passports. So I'm saying this because I believe that it is not about making archives become fetish, but it's rather wondering how we can manage and process these documents that have become disembodied. How can we share them? Because there's no archive if it's not shared. This is something we talked about a lot yesterday. We saw to, it, to which extent it is important to find new ways of sharing archives and we will see it this afternoon with a show and there's a thousand ways of doing this. In history, we get to the book really quickly and I've tried to develop things within the book. This is what I called the writing by montage with Dominique Califin, my colleague who disappeared, a 19th century um, historian. We tried to assemble with cuttings and clippings of different archives. We tried to reassemble the life of Vidal, uh, assassin of women, and we actually used social clippings and archives. We made this book from the archives that belonged to different worlds. We did the same with Thérèse de Lusieur. In order to finally reach, I'm going to go over this very fast, and we finally reach this. After Hendrik Brock's plan, I would like to talk about this practice, which is more of an Anglo-Saxon practice rather than Latin. And it's basically scrapbooking. The scrapbooking practice as an individual archiving method of different archives that are of a collective nature because scrap a scrapbook is not an intimate journal or diary. It is a sort of thematical album where we can archive the history of the world and the history of images in particular. I was very much interested in this and in trying to work with scrapbooks created in Canada at the time of the birth of the first or well, the birth of the first quintuplets in a farm in Ontario. The birth of these quintuplets um, well was documented. That's over. My time is over. Okay, I'll go forward very fast. We did this and we also did this. And I want to 
I had a lot, as you can see, I had a lot to share, but the scrapbook allows us to try and imagine the book in a different way and to exhibit archives in a different way, closer to what they are. So vernacular practices. Another vernacular practice is tattooing. And I'm going back to the body. Since the end of the 19th century, the first physicians and doctors who became interested in tattoos proved that tattooing was a self-biographical practice in the beginning. One is actually telling their lives with tattoos. Zumbaland is a great um, and major character of tattooing. You write things on your body because it's the only material support that you have to preserve your own archive. It is not only a notebook that we carry on us, it's actually the tattoo we have on our body. And here you can see me, I'm sure you can, can't recognize me, but it is me. And here I worked with some archives of one of my uncles. He was a Jesuit and was assassinated by an Italian soldier in the year in which Mussolini reached power. And I was, oh, I had very few archives and the first thing I did when I got to be Modici in Rome was to buy uh, one of these cassocks and I wore it for five days. Obviously the aim was to produce archive and everything that motivated me to be in Rome for one year and to write a book was to produce archive and to rewrite or produce from this forgotten and neglected element a new document. Rome is the city of epigraphy, of exhibited written, written documents, archivium. We saw this this morning. This is the first place, the first building. So as a historian, we, as historians, invent in the sense of discovery. And this is what I wanted to do. This was the results. This was a short book entitled History Games. You can see the cassock here once again. And there was no anti-religious aspect at all here. What I wanted to do was to experience what constitutes the main dressing identity of this guy. Obviously, I did everything a historian needs to do. I read Gregorian, but I started by this. Obviously, he was assassinated, so I tried to see how that, what felt, how, how that felt like. And I tried to reproduce being assassinated in a street in Rome. There were not so many fascist young people. This is, well, our own epoch. We need to recall it. So this is the situation of immigrants. And here we can see immigrants, youngsters coming from Libya at the time. And they were there in Rome. I will pass over this and I'll reach the last example. And maybe we can go back to this in the debate. This is the fact that, well, being an archivist on the one hand and being a showman of archives on the other hand. This is the Pompidium Center. I was invited. I was invited to accompany and to work for the center and I proposed uh, to do a popular archive of the Pompidou Center. This was in 2017. The project was very simple. There was an office, a cardboard office, like a public civil servant and people came to see me. And why? Well, 
because I use the hypo hypothesis. I go to the Pompidou uh, Center often and I had this idea that it was a place where words circulated and people came to talk to me to explain me and the others uh, to, to, to tell me um, their memories and their reminiscence of their relationships things that you cannot find in archives and administrative archives or any other type of archives and the idea was that perhaps for historians an important matter here is to question or challenge what this type of place can produce in terms of archives. So what archives can this center produce? These places gather all other places. I was interested in seeing what type of archives could the Pompidou Center produce. And this is the end. Obviously, we had to reproduce and restitute all this by using modalities that were based on the historical narrative. We, have, we had to explain in a low voice um, or out loud to the audience what others showed me as archive. I was not too successful with photography, as you can see, but here you can see my office, my desk, and you see these people listening to this historian exhibitionist while I was trying to make a moment exist. This was also a very economical way of doing things, of course, because we always forget. And in France, we always pay a lot of attention to money and we say, okay, one linear meter of archives represents 60 euros annually forever eternally. So this moment with the Pompidou Center, I, I think that this um, desk was 150 euros with the chair and as I'm a civil servant I asked for nothing back, I asked for no pay in that sense, so we'll see. And I'm saying this now when my beloved country is in the midst of a very deep crisis. I don't know when we can leave that behind, but at any rate, archives are something that can leave uh, the walls that enclose them thanks to artists. And this is one of the main challenges to precisely prevent archives from stopping being citizens and becoming a place that is separate from society. I would like to see Will of producing archives everywhere and very likely this would mean that our common world was not separate anymore. Thank you very much. I'm a bit sorry because I went on for longer, but thank you for your attention.